Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of the American Conversation Series, sponsored by the Bonnie and Bill Stubblefield Institute for Civil Political Communications. I'm David Welch, the Institute's inaugural director, and it's so nice to see so many people here. On behalf of uh, President Mary Hendricks, Provost Scott Beard, the Board of Governors, our Institute of Board of Advisors, and the entire Shepherd community, uh, I, uh, who, who are here to uh, support this inst institute. It means a great deal that you'd have come to the first one in November. So many of you have now come back, and I know some of you are here for the first time. Uh, but uh, if this is a sign of enthusiasm for the topic in which we're covering, it's really, uh, I think, a, a lot of support in the community. Um, I want to certainly acknowledge our communications and events manager, Sarah Bur Burke, for her hard work in organizing uh, the forum, and to Bridget Aguilar-Dishman, our student research assistant, and to Jordan Jalil, the Institute's student board member, for their leadership role in drafting tonight's questions for organizing this event. And I'd like uh, just to, if you'd join me in thanking this dynamic trio of shepherd educated young professionals. They just did a great job. As a matter of fact, I didn't even show up until four o'clock today. So I um, mean, they just—it was all—it was all done. It was just nice. Uh, I also want to thank Karen Rice and the active participants of the Lifelong Learning Program. I know they've got some brochures out on the table. I want to thank the friends of the Robert C. Byrd Center for Congressional History and Education. Both of these organizations have been so supportive and such great friends uh, to this institute as it's gotten off the ground in July, and uh, I'm just so grateful uh, to, to them, to our cousin organizations, uh, if you will. And of course, I want to uh, thank uh, TV10 uh, and uh, WRNR for carrying this form, uh, form live on cable television, radio, and the internet. So we don't have C-SPAN tonight uh, because I think they've got a few things going on in Washington that I've heard of and just couldn't fit Shepherdstown in tonight, but I'm pretty sure they're going to, to, be, uh, to be back. Um, before I get to the introduction of our panel, I just want to also acknowledge that we have so many things going on here on campus at the academic uh, level as well. And I'm looking at Dr. Slocum Schaefer, who is my partner on the faculty side uh, of the, in the political science department. I know that Dr. Matt Cushion in the communications department is here as well, and other faculty members from both departments. That's, at the end of the day, this is why we're here, is to support and do what we can to support those, those departments, because at the end of the day, it really is about our students. And as much as it is about uh, you know, doing things for the, for the public uh, as well, uh, we are developing this really cool program called Listen, uh, it's, I'll read it, it's Listen, Learn, Engage uh, project. And beneath that project um, is the attempt uh, to get uh, as many non-political science uh, students as possible to learn um, as much about civic engagement and the importance of civic engagement uh, as we possibly can. And uh, because I, as I say to people, I never want any Shepherd student to be that person on the Jimmy Kimmel show interviewed in Manhattan when they ask who the vice president is and they don't know because I just think <laughs> that everybody here, whether you're a poli-sci major or not, should uh, at least uh, understand uh, some of that. And so we're working uh, at that uh, level uh, as well. Um, tonight's forum, Talking Politics in an Angry America, kind of gets to the heart of our mission at the Institute, which is to think about how we can more constructively discuss and debate the great issues of our time. We believe that civic engagement begins with civil engagement, and, uh, and what better place to have that start uh, than at a college campus. And besides, what could be more fun than getting together with 300 close friends and talking politics? And our timing just couldn't be better. We've got Iowa caucus tonight. We've got State of the Union tomorrow. We've got the historic, only third time in history, vote on a impeachment of a president on Wednesday. So there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to be angry about, I guess. Uh, and a lot to disagree about, and uh, all of us in this room could turn to someone right next to them and probably find something to disagree about, uh, but that's, uh, uh, and that's fine, because the one thing I want to make clear 
that this is not a kumbaya uh, uh, institute. This is not Miss Manners. This is not an institute that's simply trying to say, hey, you know, go ahead and hate each other all you want, but just get along. It's not, they do that in Congress. Uh, we, we're, we're trying to, to do something uh, a little bit different here, and we respect completely and totally the intensity by which we hold our values and our principles. And, and if you look at our board of advisors, what a wonderful group this is because they are from person A to, uh, how I think there's 10 of them. Uh, when you put Scott Widmeyer and David Avella, for example, together on one board, uh, who work constructively together and work cohesively together and are so, and the others as well, I was just using those as two examples. Uh, we're trying to set an example in all that we do uh, for the kind of uh, world that we would like to see someday. Um, so there is a lot to talk about, so let's try and get to it. Our panel tonight is moderated by Rob Fersh. He is the founder and president of Convergence an organization that brings policy experts with divergent viewpoints together to shape shared solutions. He will be joined by Scott Widmeyer, managing founding partner of Finn Partners and formerly a key media advisor to President uh, Carter and Vice President Walter Mondale. Kelly Johnston the 20, is the 28th Secretary of the United States under Senator Bob Dole and for the past 23 years before he recently retired was a corporate vice president uh, for public uh, affairs. And Frank Sesno, Director of the School for Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University and formerly an Emmy Award winning correspondent for CNN. That's our panel tonight. Uh, look forward, I do, to, I look forward to a serious discussion about uh, polarization, about uh, p how we go about talking about politics. Uh, it will be moderated by Rob Fersh. Just one note on audience questions. You are invited to drop them in a basket in the back of the room. This is kind of a big tease, and I'm sorry to do this. I can't promise we'll get to your question because we have a lot of ground to cover in the next 90 minutes. Um, we'll get to as many as we can at the end, but that will be Rob Fersh's uh, call as moderator. So let's welcome our panel. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you, David, and very nice to be here. I've never been to this wonderful community. Had a nice drive up from the D.C. area. Wonderful to be with all of you, and I want to express my appreciation and gratitude to the Stubblefield Institute, to David, to the university for what you're trying to do here in this wonderful setting and the kinds of conversations you're having. As, as David mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm Rob Fersh. I'm the president of a group called Convergence based in Washington, D.C. Uh, you'll probably hear a little more about it from my good pal, Kelly Johnston, who's been involved with me in this idea for over 20 years. And this is the only thing I'm going to say about Convergence, at least for now. I was told I, for 30 seconds, can tell you what we do. We bring together people who disagree on big policy issues. We put them in a structured dialogue, usually for a year and a half or two years, and we usually find remarkable areas of agreement, of agreement even though people agree to disagree on a lot of stuff. So we work on K through 12 education, think teachers unions and charter schools, forming a shared vision for education. We work on incarcer we've worked on incarceration, economic mobility, think the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO talking to each other. Um, we're researching projects on gun violence right now and on restoring public faith in elections. And one project I'll just start with that we did at Kelly's suggestion was about a decade ago, Kelly said to me, and he at that point was at Campbell Soup, said, Rob, I've never been in a dialogue with consumer groups that the consumer groups haven't walked out in protest about big food. So nice little challenge, Kelly. We were able to put together uh, a session of for several years with dozens of participants, many of which called it the most remarkable frank conversation they ever had, understanding each other, and it came out with a series of concrete steps of how they could work together to deal with obesity and diabetes in this country. So that's it about convergence. We're uh, just delighted to be here to be part of this remarkable panel. Uh, it's a free-flowing conversation tonight. Um, as David mentioned, we'll hopefully have time for audience questions at the end. And we're going to do this in th sort of three major blocks, but we're going to be flexible. I'm going to pose some initial questions. The blocks basically are as follows. I'm going to ask these uh, esteemed individuals to talk about what is the cause of the problems we are having now, what's the extent of it, what are their observations about that. 
We're going to move into a section about what we all can do individually yeah. to promote civility. What do they do to promote civility and understanding across divides themselves? And then what can we all do as a country and what can the major institutions do as a country? That's the third block to try to perhaps uh, heal the divides. But that's making the assumption that we all agree that we are at a, uh, a pivotal point in this country. We're going to find that out right now as we launch block number one. So let me turn to our panelists. And uh, no, I didn't really, we didn't, we didn't like do rock, paper, scissors or anything. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll see who's, uh, who's up to answer first. But uh, let me also say this. We have, uh, as David mentioned, political balance. We have at least two people who are reflecting views more from the right and left. Frank is a media person. And I'm professionally, I feel, I, uh, I feel strongly both ways on every issue <laughs> professionally. <laughs> So uh, you got two people who are supposed to be in the middle and then two other people. But you'll see you know, this conversation go anywhere and who knows where. So I want to ask the panelists to begin with, do you agree we are angrier and more divided than any time in recent history? I heard a speech from a foundation head not long ago that said that we not only do we disagree, we, we often end up hating each other. People would rather have their families, uh, you know, uh, marry out of, the fa out of their faith than out of their political party these, these days. <laughs> so, let me ask you, what do you see as the major factors? Do you agree that we're more divided than we've been any time in, history, in recent history? What are the major factors? I hope as we go in turn, you'll just add, or if you disagree with what's said, but add to whatever else, what someone else has already said. Is the toxicity of today's politics, and I, I want to also acknowledge this, some of these questions came from students. So let me give you a few that they came up with, which I thought were great. Is, is the toxicity of today's politics upstream or downstream? from society and the population at large? Is the lack of civility and perceived lack, lack of functionality leading to greater public apathy? And what are the consequences if this pattern does not change? So who wants to lead us off? I can start. I mean, I, I think we are an angrier society today, uh, but I'm, I think we're angrier in a more broad, broad, broad way. Uh, I think when we come together as individuals and we come together as a community, we're, uh, we're pretty civil. And, and I think people are hungry to, to have that coming together. Not the kumbaya moment that David mentioned at the, in the opening, but I think people are looking for community. And that is one of the things that, that we're missing in society today. Back in the 80s, William Julius Wilson, the sociologist, said, talked then about the breakdown of communities. And this was long before what we're, what we're facing today. One of the things that he said, he talked about was the fact that uh, back in the, in, in the, into the 70s, you went into a neighborhood, there was a community center, there was a, there was a corner grocery store. Walk into a community today, you're not going to see very many community centers, and you're not going to see very, you're, not, you're, you're hardly ever going to see a, a grocery store. One of our problems is that we live in food deserts, whether it's in a rural area like where we are now, or whether it's in a major urban city. People live in food des deserts, and those things make people angry. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, Scott. I would just add that, you know, Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids, I think, chronicles a lot of the same things. Right. Frank Kelly, who wants to get All right. in? Um, Frank? Yes, it's worse. Um, I sort of see a, yeah, let me back up. I, I started my reporting career, and I'm happy to say I'm from the media and I'm here to help. Uh, <laughs> I started my reporting career uh, as, a, as a very young, very young reporter right out of college in a very small town in New England, um, where I got to know a lot of people very well because I went to school board meetings, city council meetings, and I was planted in the democracy. And I was planted in the democracy in New England where there were town meetings. That's how the budgets were, were established. And whether you agreed with somebody or not, you had to live with them. You had to mm -hmm. deal with them. And several things have changed since then. The local media that reported at that level doesn't exist anymore. The kinds of uh, dialogue that existed then are filled now with more um, anger, as you say, at virtually every level. Um, and this notion of civility has been drained from our society in many ways in the news media, in the popular media. I mean, go ahead and, and watch Netflix yeah. or watch Amazon and compare that. You know, we're, we're, and it's maybe not a bad thing because it's a lot better, but we ain't a leave it to beaver world anymore, mm -hmm. all right? Um, I remember when I was covering Ronald Reagan because I covered the Reagan administration, he, he, he said, well, he said, when I was in Hollywood, he said, you'd never hear a hell or a damn. And Reagan had the 11th commandment. Remember his 11th commandment? Thou shalt not attack another Republican. 
Now we're in a world where social media drives so much, the sense of anonymity drives so much, and this um, incivility is now coursing through our veins. Why? Um, we are experiencing an earthquake in the way we do our politics and the way we conduct business with one another. And I see the, the, the tectonic plates under that earthquake as the following. One, um, demographics. Our demographics have changed, and they've changed very rapidly. Two, um, a sense of real inequality, um, income inequality and, and, and opportunity inequality. We know from a variety of studies that sort of social mobility is actually less than what, what, it, what it should be and what it has been in the past. Um, three, globalization. And by globalization, I don't mean sort of the old Tom Friedman sense of globalization, but this big, wide world that seems somehow out of our control, and that includes immigration where people feel that they can't control even what's happening in their communities the way they may have or, or once did. And then finally, this incredible disconnect between the elite, meaning Washington and Wall Street, and so many others. Riveting experience, not too long ago, I was out in Kansas having a, doing a book talk. I was out there for something talking to the Kansas Medical Society. Great group of people, um, and very, you know, pretty conservative on the whole. And they, talk, they started talking about being referred to as flyover country and how much they resented being called flyover country. I mean, these were brilliant people, saving lives. And they're like, disposable? I mean, so we, we, have, we have, because of this technology, which is one of these tectonic plates, um, experienced a fundamental change in the way we connect, communicate, and relate to one another. Thank you, Frank. Kelly? Well, thank you very much. And let me just say, uh, I do encourage you to visit Rob's website, convergencepolicy.org. It's a tremendous organization. I was thrilled to be uh, with Rob to help start that group some a decade or so ago. And I've worked with Rob, as he mentioned, in the space for quite some time because uh, for me, it was an admission of the fact that, that having been a practitioner of campaign politics for much of my career, 35 campaigns in 25 states, I was part of the problem. And it was nice to have uh, Convergence be a place for me to go to atone for my sins uh, <laughs> and, and all the work. And frankly, I was the part of the problem. And I think part of it, we have to look at how, one, we get information. It has definitely changed. Like, Frank, I began my career as a newspaper reporter back in Oklahoma in the late 1970s. And uh, in those days, if you wanted to get the news, we all turned to watch either Walter uh, on CBS or we turned to Huntley and Brinkley on NBC or and later Jim Laird, like, who just passed away recently on, on PBS, among others. And so there was, a, there was a central organizing unit, and reporters communicated, I think, somewhat differently then than they do now. We didn't see the big panels with the big crossfire battles. Those came eventually, obviously. So I think the way we get information has changed, and it's become much too easy for us to become self-tribal, if you will. We can now go to our television set, turn on cable or, or Roku devices or whatever you may have, your computers, and decide what you will want to watch and where you get your information. And in some cases, uh, we've learned to be less skeptical of that information when we should be a lot more skeptical, frankly, of, of what we see both on, whether on the right or the left or somewhere in between. So those are just some of the observations that I have. But I, I definitely want to agree with Scott and with Frank both about what all the, the forces that have changed uh, what's transpired. And I think another factor, too, uh, is, is the way it's happened in politics is that we've all gotten much more extreme. One of my theory, now I'm, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, and one of my observations is, one, we've changed the campaign finance laws to create more of a relationship, more of a dependence by campaigns and candidates on special interest groups than their own political parties, both right and left. So one of my observations is that when you do that, then you have members of Congress coming to the Capitol who are more, uh, maybe have more allegiances to those interests or in those causes they were elected for than they do their own leadership. So it's harder for a leader, whether you're Mitch McConnell or a Chuck Schumer or, or on the House side, uh, to be able to keep your troops in line and keep them in the right direction. So we elect people differently as well. And number two is that as the government has gotten bigger, whether you agree with larger government or not, when you have larger, more, um, more I'll, I'll use the word intensive, more invasive in some cases, but a bigger government, more reliance on government, whether it's for food or for other services, 
uh, you have more at stake. So you have bigger, more challenging battles of people fighting for those dollars uh, or for those causes or those laws in Washington. So those are all factors. It's not just one thing. I think we all, have you seen that from what we're all saying? We're all kind of agreeing with each other, perhaps to some degree. Uh, uh, but I think it's a, it's a really, it's a complicated mix. Uh, and if I may, I, I, yeah. I, since you acknowledge that maybe your part of the world was part of the problem at yeah. some level, I would be remiss if I didn't do the same. <laughs> uh, you know, the, you talk about the media. So when I started at that little radio station I told you about, I didn't go out with my, you know, with my kid or go to my meetings thinking that I'm serving one part of the community or the other. I, I, my job was to report what was happening at the city council meeting or at the school board meeting to everybody. When I was with the Associated Press, there was no notion that the audience was divided among partisan lines and I was supposed to hit one part or the other. We were supposed to tell what we saw. When I was bureau chief at CNN, I wrote a memo that I'm very, very proud of, but belongs at a museum someplace right next to a thing called a newspaper. Uh, <laughs> and I, I wrote a note to the correspondents. I said, when you're doing live shots, please try to avoid the use of two words, I think. The audience doesn't really care what you think. They care what you see, what you hear, what you observe, what you can report. And now we're in a completely different world. And it's not just in cable, it's across, it's across the universe. And for those who don't follow it closely, a brief moment of background is important because it, it is maybe, to some extent, inevitable. When the internet exploded, it blew up the whole model that, that newspapers and sort of the, the nightly news had lived on forever, which is that in the morning, or at 6.30 at night, you would go and get the news from what happened that day. And so it started pushing this whole, we need to be more interpretive with our coverage. We can't just tell people what happened. They already know that because they've been getting that online. Interpretation becomes analysis, becomes opinion, becomes commentary. And that's where we've gotten. And so now, and this is a serious challenge, the media really are divided in this way. And so it amplifies amplifies minute by minute, hour by hour, these divisions and these differences. And good luck if you're, if you're an elected official and trying to get something done and actually trying to explain a policy yeah. to the public, because you're, you're barely going to get that platform. And I want to pick up on a point that Kelly made and a point that Frank just made. Uh, money is really one of the evil parts of politics today. It is out of control. Uh, it's all about fundraising, uh, and Citizens United with the Supreme Court case uh, has just corrupted the, the process even more. Uh, hopefully we can do something about it if Congress decides they want to act and, and take up some new approaches. Uh, the campaign season in this country goes on for, the, you know, this presidential campaign, the, the campaigns we're watching today, how long has it been going on now? A year, and we still have another year left. That's crazy. Uh, in other democratic countries around the world, small d, uh, those, these campaigns last for a couple of months. Ha let me, let me, how many people in this room would rather have a campaign that lasts for two or three months as opposed for two or three years? <laughs> Thank you. See a lot of hands. The other yeah. point, the <laughs> point that Frank it. made about the media, uh, we're living in a media world today that if you live in a local community, again, it's, it's back to my community thing, if you live in a local community, we'll take Martinsburg for an example, or Charleston, West Virginia as an example, or Burlington, Vermont as an example. Those newspapers covering that community, instead of having 15 or 20 reporters that typically worked at those newspapers 10 years ago, you're lucky to find five reporters in that organization now. And what does that do to, to a community? It means that they're not out there covering stories of interest. They're not investigating local government. I talk to mayors and governors who say, I no longer have reporters show up yeah, at all. I don't exactly. see them. There's yeah. nobody reporting yeah. what's happening here back to the public. And that's a problem. And that creates a lot of the issues that we're here to deal with. So let me ask you all, thank you for the great opening conversation. And feel free to just make my, my role obsolete. Uh, <laughs> just keep talking. Um, so I heard a little bit, and this is to answer the student's question about kind of is polarization top down or bottom up. I actually heard both, yes. People are polarized in communities. There's lack of community, lack of places to go to get to know each other. And of course, the key at convergence to how we break down um, the differences amongst people is we form relationships of trust. We don't debate the issues. They get to know one, uh, each other as full human beings. And that is the secret sauce of how to have people, you know, moderate how they look at each other and each other's points of view. 
But let me ask you all, I mean, you've, you've talked about, you know, bottom up, that's, you know, lack of community, people in communities are divided, economic differences and so on. And you've talked about the role of media maybe fueling the fire and, you know, people are doing opinions and Kelly mentioned, uh, you started with uh, the way people get elected and Scott, you added to money in politics. What about the primary system? What about, are we, some people would say, yeah, it originally was a white hat kind of idea, take it out of the back rooms who gets chosen. And now we have a system where, do we have a system where people who get elected tend to be more radical left or right than, than the people they represent? Well, just one observation, having done all those campaigns all those years I did, uh, one of the things I got involved in back in 1980 was my very first congressional reapportionment district. In this case, it was Indiana, which at the time, and I think has returned to Republican control. And I remember sitting at the computer with my then incumbent freshman congressman boss about and going through and deciding what our alliance would look like. And the objectives back in those days, and much of this really began in California a decade or so before that, uh, but how do you design your congressional districts if you're an incumbent or, you, or you're a state senator who would like to be a congressman, you're the one drawing a district, how do you draw it in a way that looks to be a pretty safe seat so it does take away the, the money uh, needs, the, the less challenging campaigns, so you can really focus on being a legislator. Well, there was a consequence of that. Now you've got very competitive primaries. You've got being, people being tugged to the far right or being tugged to the left because that's where the energy and now the money has begun to emerge and thinking both of our political parties. And so that, that's where we're losing that, that middle, if you will. We still have people in the middle. Fortunately, you can't reapportion state lines. So the Senate, I think, does have more of a moderate, uh, although some folks are working on that in Virginia, I'm told. But, uh, <laughs> but you can, you can, uh, you can um, uh, with, I think you can have a little bit more of a middle on both parties in the Senate more than you think. And also the Senate, having been a creature of the place, operates very differently for reasons I won't go into now, but from the House. But clearly, you, uh, you know, talking to House members, they said, well, I thought I was designing a pretty safe seat, and all of a sudden I'm looking to my right or looking to my left, and I've got a big primary opponent. So I've got to vote a certain way to keep my base happy. And so that's become a self-defeating prophecy as well. I, uh, a few years ago, was asked to, to go up onto Capitol Hill and moderate a completely off-the-record conversation of members of Congress, House and Senate, Republican and Democrat. And it was jaw-dropping. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that they said, and there was a fairly large group of people there, was that not only are we not rewarded for compromise, we're penalized for compromise. And they're penalized for compromise because of that kind of redistricting, where you have districts that move farther to left or right. So if you are farther one side or the other, why would your constituency, never mind whether you're primary, be happy to see you move to the center to get something done? Throw social media on top of that and the noise machine that you can quickly make, and being a legislator suddenly isn't a lot of fun. <laughs> and you are, not, you are not rewarded for compromise. Uh, uh, go ahead. You know, and there, to, to Frank's point, that's true. And they're, 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 they're not representing the, the, the society at large. And Donna Brazil touched on this if you were at the event in November. The fact that the, the Demo registered Democrats and registered Republicans only may, they represent 56% of the country. The rest of the country are independents. So we're, we're uh, alleged, well, they're, but they're not Democrats or Republicans. They, they go both ways. We've seen this in recent elections. And we're not hearing from them. Uh, so let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let, let, I'm going to do folks. one final question for this sort of tranche that we're on in a second. I just want to affirm what Frank just said. We at Convergence are actually helping to staff a, a group called the, a caucus in the House called the Bipartisan Working Group. You should all be pleased to hear, if you're interested in civilians, it's 24 members, 12 R's, 12 D's, trying to work together. And we've staffed, we've facilitated a retreat, we bring up speakers, but they're up against the same constraints. In fact, uh, the chair, uh, co-chair of that committee actually told the story of building a strong relationship early in his tenure in Congress. And, and uh, his, his counterpart from the other party came in and says, I, I can't stand it. I really like you, but I can't work with you and get reelected. So, there, and, and in fact, then the chairman of this caucus said, when I go home, uh, the only main criticism I get is I'm talking to the other side too much. So there's, there's sort of the wrong incentives, if you will, in Congress. Uh, I, if I may, ahead. you know, think about Obamacare, purely partisan vote, impeachment, purely partisan vote, tax cut, purely partisan vote. That is, it. you want to build consensus in a country, you can't have gigantic policy decisions like that being lopsided, because then you change the power and you go back, you know, go back, you go back and forth, 
and it becomes part of the, the echo chamber. So, look, so you're all upset and concerned, it sounds to me, about this situation. Well, what, what are the consequences if nothing changes? And people talk about the federal debt and deficit, and it keeps getting higher and higher and higher beyond all belief, and at this point, no one has quite seen consequences. Are we just uh, yelling chicken here, or what's the right phrase, yelling whatever we're supposed to, what chicken little yelling, whatever chicken yell, little yelled, uh, fire. This guy is. Uh, uh, yes. So what, what, what's the story, what will happen, what are the consequences? I, and I'll just add one sort of, I think, serious note. I mean, I have serious friends on both sides of the aisles predicting that no matter the outcome of the presidential election, we'll have violence in this country by people upset one way or another. So what are the consequences of polarization now? Are we gonna see a worse thing in a way that's gonna feel more dramatic and maybe you bring us back to the divisive times of the 1960s? Well, just uh, an example, the, it's already happened. I mean, you all remember a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, we had the, the shooter on a congressional baseball field down in Virginia for a very wonderful annual charity event that both members of Congress, uh, both houses uh, do a, a charity event, a baseball game and to have a, a shooter show up, very politically motivated, decided to take aim and, and severely wounded uh, Congressman Steve Scalise. So we've seen evidence, and there are other incidences. Now, it's not to say we haven't had some violence in our history. There was this little skirmish, you may recall, there's a battlefield across the river here that may be a reminder of, of, of the last time. That's not where you want to go. And there have, been, there have been instances where there have been uh, people shot in the Capitol. I mean, I remember, I tell a story, oh, Tell a story. Rob uh, had a fantastic program on U.S. Muslim relations, and I was able to give a, a capital tour to a group of Pakistani legislators. It was an incredibly moving experience. It was a part of an all-day discussion about, and it was a very, by, by their definition, their own multipartisan group. You have the Christian, the Muslim, the I mean, all, and I gave them this tour, and I always end the tour. Pardon me, the tour at one spot. It's on the uh, stairwell, big, beautiful marble staircase on the house side between a second and a first floor. And there are stains on those steps. And so I always say, well, you all stand to the sides here. I'm going to tell you why these stains are here. And I tell the story of the 1889 shooting of a, of a former congressman turned lobbyist by a news reporter. Um, and it was in self-defense. And so I said, we've always had incidences, the Puerto Rican shooting in the 1950s in the house. You can still find the bullet mark. So, and, and when I told the story to our friends from Pakistan, one of them said, oh, just like back home. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's not, it, we had cases like this, but I think for me, and this is one observation, Rob, I want to make, and it, it's, it is both, it's, it's like our technology. It is both a blessing and a curse. Uh, it has so, it's improved lives in so many ways, created wonderful economic opportunities, but it's also created the atmosphere that we're now in. In my world, I was in the food business for 23 years. So I worked for major food companies, worked for one in particular. And one thing I have noted over the last, my last four or five years is that I have never seen a time where consumers were more empowered to make food choices and were driving what companies were doing. That wasn't always the case. Companies or farmers say, we're growing it, you're making it, and you're gonna eat it. Uh, and that's not, you now you just walk away because you get to do what you want. So we have the most free marketplace. And much of that has also happened in the political and communication marketplace. Individuals are now more empowered thanks to social media. Uh, I used to do media training 25 years ago, and I always said that anybody with a computer and a modem, that's old fashioned, could be a reporter. Well, guess what? Everybody's now jumped into the media business in their own way, uh, whether it's on Twitter, which is probably the worst in terms of, of civil communication and others. So we've empowered people, but we've forgotten how to teach them to engage. Thanks, Kelly. Let me go to Scott and, and Frank, just for a final word here on this section on what are the consequences of this pattern of division and polarization doesn't change. I mean, the consequences will be, uh, will be continued gridlock. Uh, Fra Frank touched on the fact that, you know, we've, uh, we've, we're divided, part, there's a huge partisan political divide whether it comes to impeachment, whether it com comes to health care, uh, and some of the bigger, the bigger things that w one would hope would be handled, like infrastructure, which could create millions and millions of jobs, real jobs, and that's part of our problem. We have, a, we have so many people in the American society today who can't find good jobs. Uh, and, and this whole issue of a skilled workforce has been, a skilled workforce has been developing 
for the last 20 or 30 years, but the United States has not stepped up and you know, technology has come in. We're now dealing with robots. Robots are gonna become bigger and bigger. AI is gonna become bigger and bigger. So we're gonna see more jobs go down, go, go away. But with infrastructure, there's millions and millions of jobs that can be created. And this was done in previous administrations, uh, back with Roosevelt and with Truman and with Eisenhower. Eisenhower started the interstate program. That's the kind of programs we need to kind of jumpstart the American economy. But where's the leadership to do it? Uh, it's not there. So the, con the consequences, you can, it's okay. Uh, the consequences are, in fact, continued gridlock. Um, I worry even more, though, about, you know, we've had gridlock before, and you can kind of deal with gridlock. I, I worry about um, a fundamental undermining of faith in our institutions and who we are and what we represent. I worry about a loss of confidence in the, as I say, the institutions that, that make us special, the rule of law, our court system, our, our judicial system. Uh, the media, okay, lots of problems in the media, lots. Sensational, sometimes. Unfair, sometimes. Um, tawdry, plenty of times. Um, but you want to know if the meat that's being sold in your supermarket is bad and is going to make you sick. You want to know if there's a virus on the loose that can kill your kid, all right? We are hunters and gatherers of information, and we need it. And so I do think, and even I check myself sometimes, it's really easy to get down on, on journalism and on the media. But there's a lot of great journalism that's done, and it's super important. And we do need to hold the powerful to account in this country. That is what a democracy is, whether you're a CEO or a priest or a president. And we need to... So what I worry about is undermining the, the, those institutions. And then the other thing I worry about is undermining the sense of, of, of what it means to be an American. What does that mean? It was, it was easy, you know, easier for some, not everybody, never for everybody, you know, when we were coming out of a war or when we were coming out of the moonshot. Pride or fear can drive you. But what drives us now? Identity politics? That's not enough. So I think one of the dangerous consequences here is undermining our sense of community and society and the social cohesion that we need in a large and very diverse population because the veneer of civilization can be pretty thin. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to move this to another section. And keeping in mind, we probably have a lot of students in the room. With the lights on here, we can't see who you are. So you're safe. We cannot, uh, <laughs> no, you're not. Students are never safe yeah. here. <laughs> we are coming for you. Yeah. yeah. So let me, but thinking of the students in particular, think, sitting here, and because the next section is going to be what, what are the solutions for us as a society and our institutions and so on, think about what we as individuals can do about this. How do we conduct our own lives? Um, you know. How do we go about understanding different points of view or, or creating community where it doesn't exist? I want to ask also about social media. Um, you know, as Kelly, I know you're very active on social media. I read portions of a book not that long ago by Sally Cohn, who was a liberal commentator on Fox News. And she wrote a book called um, The Opposite of Hate. I'll just tell you a quick story about that. She was getting such abusive email and tw tweets and getting responses that, you know, and even though she's there and she's day-to-day -day friendly with Sean Hannity and other people, but she's giving a liberal point of view, she decided, I'm paraphrasing the book, to actually call up some of these people. And it turned out a whole bunch of them were really very apologetic. They just fired off a tweet or an email, and, and when she called them and said who she was, they had a decent conversation. They built a relationship. I think she stayed in touch with some. So I just... So sometimes I just wonder if some of this isn't a false tower we build of division once, uh, that would be broken down by knowing each other. But let me turn to each of you, and, and if you could speak to both what you do and as you talk to our audience, especially the young people, what could they do if they want to create a more civil, caring, and relational society? 
Okay, I'll start. I mean, I, I think we all need to do, we need to follow those three points up there, listen, learn, and engage. We need to, we need to get out and talk to more people. We need to listen to what's on their minds. We're not always, you're not necessarily going to agree, you know, 100% with what they're putting out there. They may be a Trumpy or they may be a Bernie person, but, but they have a point of view. They need to be heard, and, and you, can talk, you can talk through with them and understand where they're coming from and why they're taking these positions. I, I try to do that as much as possible. I know I can do a better job of it, but li like I go to the gym occasionally uh, where I live in, in near Kingston, New York, and there's a guy there who I talk to regularly. He's a big Trump guy, uh, but he's smart. And we exchange uh, opinions. <laughs> and, uh, he's a, he, you, know, you know what I'm saying. But Oops. I listen to him, and he listens to me. And we walk away. I learn something about where he's coming from, and he learns something about where I'm coming from. And I think we need to have more of that. And, and I, chances are most of the people in this room are doing that. If you're not, get out there and do it, whether it's at the gym, at the church, in the grocery store, here in the student union if you're a student, uh, wherever you are, just have those conversations. You're going to learn so much, and maybe we can build some consensus. Um, and the other thing, the, the final point I want to make is that it's time that we as an American public demand that our political leaders start on a better course of civility. And guess what? It starts with the guy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. So, so I, you know, what we, what we are suffering from in this country, among several things, is, is an empathy deficit. Uh, I was at dinner the other night with a, a good friend who is not a Trumpy. Not only is he not a Trumpy, he's a crazy man, not Trumpy. And I said, you got to calm down. You just got to calm down. And for a moment, try this exercise of putting yourself in the place of someone who doesn't live in Washington, doesn't live in New York, doesn't hang out with the people you hang out with, has, has not had a meaningful raise in a while, or has had a meaningful raise and has watched the dollars get misspent, or watched wars that take place that don't get won, and is just angry. Is that not a legitimate position? Um, one of the great things about being a reporter, um, and I've been so lucky with the, with, the, with the career that I've had, is that you end up talking to and engaging just about everybody. I mean, every walk of life, whether it's a CEO or a single mom in the inner city, a farmer or a fisherman. And when you listen, when you really listen, you hear amazing people, often up against pretty tough odds, try, most of them trying to live good lives. And I think that one of the things that's really easy in the social media environment that we're in and in the media that we're environment in is quickly to make a judgment, toss an allegation, decide that someone is a dirt ball, and, and, and kind of move on. And, and you know, I tell, I, 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 again, I've done a lot of this work, and so I was talking to somebody not long ago, and I said, and they said, well, the, the problem is that it, this is, we're a one-issue country now, and it's all about abortion. Abortion is what, what divides us, and this is a terrible thing. And I said, well, just, you know, let's say that you are vehemently pro-life, and that is your single issue, and you really believe Babies, innocent babies are being killed, murdered. And that motivates you. Now, you may disagree with that, but do you understand where that person's coming from and the intensity of that feeling? And can you have a discussion and a debate from there? It's always going to be tough, but you're going to do better if you can at least try to have a sense of where the person fundamentally is coming from. So that empathy, that putting yourself in someone else's shoes, trying to look through their eyes, trying to imagine what they hear. I did a series a few years ago with four single moms on public assistance. It was one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. One mom had six children. The other moms, um, they'd all had substance abuse issues in their lives. Every single one of them talked about wanting to be a better mom. They acknowledged their, 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 the mistakes they had made and their shortcomings. And one of them said, but I got a job interview tomorrow, and I'm so excited about that. And I said, really, where's that? She said, at Children's Hospital. And I said, well, really, that's awesome. What are you going to be doing? And this may have been the mom with six kids, and I think the mom with six kids, two of them had some pretty serious medical issues. 
And she said, I'm gonna, I, I, I think I'm going to be a dispatcher or something like that. And I said, that's great. What are you going to make? What's the pay? And she said, I don't know. It's probably minimum wage. And I thought, minimum wage, six kids, two of them with medical conditions. It's pretty complicated out there. And that complexity is something that we need to put our brains around better, too. Great. Thanks, Ron. Kelly? I could just, I think I can sum up. I agree with nearly all. I'm not sure the White House is where all the problems are in the I didn't, model. I, I didn't say all, <laughs> but I said it starts there. Well, it starts at a variety of places. I would say that the one word that I have really tried to, to relearn is the word uh, humble and humility. Yeah. Uh, that word appears about 95 times in the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. It's an important word for, those, for people of faith and others. It's a big word. There's a lot to unpack there. I'm not going to do it here, but I encourage everybody that's trying to figure out how they can personally engage more effectively and more civilly is to look and study that word very carefully. It's a ter terrific Forbes uh, article. I forget the author's name. I apologize for that. But he wrote the 12 uh, characteristics of a humble person. First of all, important to note that humble doesn't mean passive or indecisive or insecure. Hardly that at all. It means somebody, as, as Frank and Scott have described, as somebody who is inquisitive, who is open. Uh, and you can tell them when you have a conversation with a truly humble person, they're going to be asking you the questions. And they're one trying to learn from you. And often, uh, they, uh, in getting to also defining your terms, a communication skill, it's very important. I think we've all forgotten. We've forgotten that sometimes that different words have now mean different things. Right. The same word means different things to different people. So it's important in a conversation, whether it's online or in person, if you're not clear what somebody means, have them define their term with you when you do that. I think it's very important. But I would start with a really good in-depth study of the, of, the, of the word humility. I think it would be a really eye-opening experience and a good guide that incorporates what both Scott and Frank have said. Can I do a quick plug? Please. So I wrote this book. <laughs> oh, thank you, Frank. Yeah. What's the uh, name it, of it, Frank? It's, it's, it's Ask More. Uh, and, and so every, if everybody here buys 100 copies and gives it to 100, no. Um, <laughs> no, but it was inspired by just what you said. Yeah. What, do, what do I do as a reporter? I ask questions. And if you ask, what do you have to do? Well, it would be kind of a good thing to start with listening. <laughs> and I, I, as I started thinking about this, and Scott knows because he and I brainstormed about this along the way, you know, we got too many exclamation points and too few question marks out there right now. So to stop ourselves and say, wait, before I, before I issue a, make a statement, can you tell me a little bit more about what you just said? Tell me why, you, why do you feel that way? What, uh, th that, would, that helps humility and the listening a lot. And can I just add yeah, one, please, uh, one, more, one more tip in terms of behavioral change that probably could impact all of us? And Frank mentioned this, and I'll just add to it a little bit. Progressives need to do a better job understanding the religious differences that people have in our world today. I don't think we've done a very good job understanding and appreciating where people come from and their religious backgrounds. So I think we need to do a better job there. Conservatives, they need to do a better job understanding workers, workplace issues, and workers' rights, and actually appreciating the role that labor unions have played in building up our democracy. I think there's a role for labor unions in the future, and if the Republican Party was smart, they would probably move over and, and start uh, playing, playing that tune a little bit better. So we're going to shift in a second to the third block, but if you take Kelly's advice about paying attention to being humble, you can soon brag about how humble you are. <laughs> so it's a good result. Um, oh, shucks. <laughs> been, wait, been waiting to use that line. Uh, so let me, let me move to the third big tranche here. Um, you heard a lot about what you can do as individuals, and I hope uh, what, what came out there came through about, you know, even on social media, I think twice about how you express what you express. And, and, and I'll just say this, when we work with and I, going into the third tranche, I'll say we work with power brokers. We work with groups you wouldn't think could even talk to each other. But it turns out eventually it, the relationships are magnificent. These are decent human beings. Just because they're in Washington doesn't mean they necessarily are evil and can't be reached. And they're just like anyone else. They all came from somewhere else. So the, when you have people, um, one of our greatest tools is to have shared learning. When people learn new things, maybe take them out of their comfort zone or maybe have to think differently, have new information. It's a shared experience. Mm -hmm. So think about that, and that's good for each of us as we learn from each other. So I want to reinforce what the panel said. 
All right, so we've said the things are in bad shape. We said they're not going, going up anytime soon. We, there are dire consequences if we don't do something about it. What should we be doing about all this? Uh, what, can, what can we do about money in politics if that's an issue? Kelly, I know you and I have talked about that over the years. What, how do we get at this? We tried, uh, Convergence tried to organize a project in the media last year. We couldn't get our arms around it. In fact, we were in conversations with, with David Brooks about some ideas he had there. So what can the media do, you media experts, uh, to fix that? I want to also mention that there's a select committee on modernization in the Congress right now on the House side trying to deal with some of these issues very earnestly, including mm -hmm. civility. How could they restructure even how they set up committees and hearings and talk to each other differently so there are some top-down things. So let me go to this panel of experts to hear your big thoughts, at least one, start with one round and interact about what are your biggest thoughts about how do we begin to turn this ship around um, in terms of reducing polarization and division in the country. Well, Kelly? can I throw out one idea yeah. that I think I mentioned to you before? Um, you know, one of the things, if, for those of you who are on Twitter, I'm not suggesting you become Twitter people. That can be a, it's an interesting pool with no lifeguards. So be careful with that one. Uh, is the blue, getting the blue check mark, which means you have a certain number of follows, a certain number of status. It's, it's kind of pretty covered by a lot of people. I don't have one, by the way. Uh, my thought is that it would be nice to develop what I would call a green check mark to have an organization develop standards of communication on social media that people then would really covet that green check mark to say a trusted source who's civil who lives by certain rules and standards for communicating on social media. So that's just one thought I have. I'll throw it up and maybe that's something we can talk about. So, uh, we, 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 you know, this is a very cheerful evening um, <laughs> filled with good news. But, you know, you talked about consequences and, and, and what we can do. There are some very positive things that are happening. Yes. Uh, I have I cannot I can't recall a time when as many people were engaged in as big a conversation as we have right now about who are we that it's where are we going what do we do about it that it's driven by crisis is sort of human nature all right that happens but people are engaged students on my campus the students on this campus young people are and students are engaged and they are empowered all right and whether it's the climate strike or the um, Me Too movement, or the March for Our Lives, students plus social media plus an issue that people care about translates to power, all right? Greta Thunberg, like her or not, at 16 years old, has done more than all of us probably in the room put together in terms of, in terms of driving conversation. I sat next to this kid. David Hogg, who was a survivor from the Parkland shooting, he came to GW. The students asked me to do a little conversation with him. I said, don't you want a peer doing that? You know? They said, no, we'd like you to do it. I said, I was honored. I mean, what this young man went through, what he talked about, and what he's mobilized, again, whether you agree with him on guns or not, that he is driven to do this, that's an encouraging thing. So I think where the, where, where the, where the power now lies is not at the top where the influence and the change makers lie are not at the top. They are in the grassroots, and it's going to be the grassroots, and it's going to be the younger people who are going to drive this. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with that. I mean, what I, my, a couple points I would make is, and I touched on, touched on this at the beginning, I think it's important that we, that we totally reform the money uh, set up in politics today. Uh, there's too much money involved. We've got to get out get out of it. We've got to shut down a lot of the political action committees. We've got to shut down a lot of the firms that are making tons and tons of money off of this. Uh, I, I, I have How a. How do you do that? Though? Well, you come up with the with new new regulations. Who's, uh, and who's we, you? Me? I mean. Who, no, who, we've who, got to, We have to have political leaders who are willing to stand up and change the system. But you need a, But you're going to need, need a revolution need, from the ground the people, up to do that. We need people like the, in the room here tonight, and there's tens of thousands around the country who would stand up and lead this movement. We've got to get it done. We can't. If we have 20 or 30 more years of what we've just gone through the last 20 or 30 years, then we're totally screwed. Totally screwed. Uh, the uh, the other simple thing we should do is that the two parties if they have the guts to do it, need to have the politicians that are part of the Democratic Party and the politicians that are part of the Republican Party sign a statement that says, I'm going to, I'm going to run a campaign, I'm going to run my office that's based on civility, I'm not going to put out statements that are flamethrowers, 
and the Republicans in the United States Senate and the Republicans in the House need to get off their butt and not carry the water of Donald Trump and just sit there like, you know, like uh, little babies that are afraid to do anything. They need to stand up and do something. And if Donald Trump is reelected, we cannot, we can't have four more years of the kind of Congress we've just gone through. That will be the destruction of this country. Kelly, would you like? To yeah, I'll just mention. I mean, I, I, I'll give you my own personal history. I, uh, Donald Trump was not my first, second, or third choice in the primaries as a Republican. In fact, I was not happy he was nominated, and I actually left the party for a while because of it. But as I look at what's transpired in our country, I'm, I've become, if you will, a reluctant Trump supporter. I refuse to blame him entirely. He is more the symptom than the cause. Now, he, in many respects, could do a much better job. I don't like his Twitter feed very much. I wish they would take his phone away from him yes. every so often. Uh, but he is really the symptom of a much bigger problem in our country. And it's not just in the White House. It's also in the Congress. It's also, as Frank mentioned, in the media. And frankly, it's among us as well. So it's, it's, we need to really... Getting to the, I think the underlying point that both Frank and Scott were saying is that we need to realize we are empowered more than we think. And yes, we can do, a, you know, they, these people are accountable to us. We need to hold them accountable, Democrat or Republican or Independent, and say, look, this is what we expect, and make it count at the ballot box or with our dollars. And I agree with Scott. I do think we need some campaign finance reform. My biggest problem, frankly, with, uh, is that, one, there is, we're awash in cash. There's too many people who are, have, have financial interest in this political system. I agree with that. Uh, but I also think that... Uh, one way of dealing with it, one of the big consequences is we've made it so difficult for individual congressmen to raise money, they have to raise in small amounts uh, that there's all this, like a big balloon of cash that now moved to independent expenditure campaigns. So we find in many congressional districts in many states, I think the Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina mentioned that when he first ran uh, four or five years ago, that $100 million was spent in his state. But only about a fifth of that, maybe a third, was from his campaign, and another third from his opponent. And more outside money coming in that the candidates have no control over. They're not controlling their own messages. This is supposed to be an election about candidates and their differences and what they're trying to accomplish. So trying to figure out a way to turn off that spigot of outside independent expenditure is really important. And I made this, if we can redirect it so at least it goes to the candidates and they're in charge of their own message would really help that because I do think they would do a better job and we can hold them accountable for their messages. Can I, can I pose another question to the audience? We can't see too much because it's dark out there, but um, some. Could you, could you raise your hand high for us, if you would, if you have read, heard, or seen a, a news story in the last month about something in government that works and has improved lives? I see one hand out there, Scott. Two? Okay. Three hands? So I think that the another thing, th that's, that's terrible. There was an organization a few years ago that I worked with called the Council for Excellence in Government. It is not an oxymoron. <laughs> um, and they gave awards to, to local and, and municipal and state governments that did remarkable things. So one went to Seattle for this incredible water runoff thing that they had done so that they were not having dirty water with oil and all the rest from the roads go right into the river. You have libraries. You have police forces. We have roads. We have schools. We have all these things that people in public life do. And one of my concerns when I think about the media and the larger world, where do we hear about the success, the, the good intentions that, that people have? We've turned everybody into a loud and angry soundbite, it seems. So one of the things that I would like to see, this will never happen, but that's why I want to see it, <laughs> is what if every news organization had a column or something that actually focused on the progress, the, the, the success, the ideas that work, the people who are effective. Doesn't mean it's a big wet kiss. It doesn't mean that you overlook the bumps and the, and the mistakes that they make. But part of our problem is like we've lost hope. We've lost, I, all these presidents that I've covered uh, until the current occupant, they have, they have had these incredible 
idealistic rhetoric, rhetorical flourishes. You know, I covered great. The shining city on the hill. George Bush, a kinder and gentler America. O Obama, you know. Uh, and they, wh whether they delivered, and they didn't all the time. But they would, they would make this kind of call to our better natures, to our aspirations. You know, think of JFK and going to the moon. We don't go there because it's easy. We go there because it's hard. And we, can, we need to call on that. We need to summon that again because we're still doing it. We still have amazing people doing amazing things. Can I, can I just, I want to give, you, I want to give the audience a, a quote that I, that I came across I, in reading a couple weeks ago, but, and I remember this when he did it, but Robert Kennedy back in 1968 gave a speech to the Cleveland City Club. I'm going to read you about two or three sentences. When you teach a man to hate and fear his brother, when you teach that he is lesser because of his color or beliefs, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your family, then you learn to comfort, you learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies. So I'm, I'm going to push for one more round on solutions. And let me just ask our uh, organizers if there are some questions that are going to be coming up from the audience to bring them up so I can see them. And, and if they're not, let me know that, because I'm trying to parse the time a little bit. So just bring them up as whatever you want to do. Um, you know, I want to mention, um, I don't know, Frank, if you're aware of the Solutions Journalism yeah. Group. Um, they are one group uh, based, I think, mainly out of the New York Times that really tries to uh, look at people doing positive things. And I can tell you as a group that's a do-gooder, we're pleased to have had a column written about us four and a half years ago. But the kind of work we do doesn't get credit. You know, it's, it, it's not controversial. <laughs> people reach the agreement, uh, and the people are bored. Uh, by it, but uh, keep, stay tuned. Uh, we're working on healthcare right now and a whole series of other things. I urge you to take a look. If you want to get a little hope and inspiration, some of the work that we're doing and other groups are doing uh, is part of that. But let me dig deeper with both, with all the panelists about things I heard from you about, uh, Frank, you started with it's got to be a grassroots revolution. It's going to come up for the people. And I think a lot of people agree with that. And I would pose one question in regard to that as well. Okay. Is it going to be just spontaneous? Going to be done more on purpose? How do you see that evolving? How do you see that happening? Is it a thousand flowers blooming? Are there some levers where leaders can, can help encourage that to happen? Um, and by the same token, Scott, you talked about Congress. I want to mention the Select Committee on Modernization. I'm kind of enamored of it. It's chaired by uh, Derek Kilmer and the, co and the vice chair, not the ranking Republican, is Tom Graves, a conservative from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Derek Kilmer is a moderate Democrat from Washington State. They, uh, when they sit in a hearing room, they sit Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, not Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other. The staff is joint so that they all in conversations. How do we get the best information to make better decisions? How do we have hearings in which are more about learning than trying to load up one side versus the other? Uh, I went to a session where the chair and vice chair spoke, and the chair spoke about the agenda, and the vice chair, to his eminent credit, just talked about what amazing leadership the chair had given to have people relate in a different way, and it was profound experience. So Kelly, you're a, you're a Hill veteran as well. And we heard about why some people probably can't behave this way. They're worried about being primary. But is there room for profiles of courage here, Republicans and Democrats, to say, I want to operate my committee, if I'm a committee chair and a ranking uh, minority member, differently? And what are the odds of anything like that happening? So two questions you can go either way. The ground, the ground up revolution, how does that happen? And what role can people play? And are there roles for leaders to make it safe and possible to have that happen? And what else can we do in the institution of Congress or any other institutions to help them uh, provide leadership that models it for the country differently than what we're seeing now? I'll just, um, I want to give a little bit of credit in this space. And I'm, I'm great to, grateful to hear the, the work. I've watched them carefully, and I've, I'm impressed with what they're trying to do. They've been more about building relationships than they have and actually coming up with a lot. They have pushed some reports with some good ideas. They just need to kind of start transferring that to actual rule changes and also um, start getting some support among our colleagues for it out once we get past this crazy election cycle. I would uh, want to give credit to somebody I've known for 30 years who was kind of a pioneer in this space, and that's former Congressman, former Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood. Uh, he began the Hershey retreats. Uh, one of the anomalies, Congress has changed a lot in the last 60 years. 
Uh, one of my very favorite movies about Congress is Advise and Consent. Alan Drury wrote it, a former U late UPI reporter, and it was a, showed a, a time period that's a, a fiction story, but he demonstrated a time period where members of Congress and their families moved here to Washington, the D.C. area, not just for two days a week. They came and moved here for six months and then went back home. They actually, families got to know each other. Um, uh, uh, so they showed a very different, and they socialized together. Uh, get back to the point of thing, you knew when to campaign, when not to campaign. So you were able to build some of the relationships. And so Ray LaHood tried to do that through the Hershey retreats he did a couple of times. He would say he wasn't very successful. And by the way, he just published a book called Bipartisanship that I would strongly recommend. He's now affiliated with Bradley University in Peoria, where he's from. Uh, but uh, he's a someone, I, and I've encouraged the, the bipartisan group to look and consult him because he did so much spade work, pioneer work, I mean, often thankless work in a space was derided by people in my own party and was criticized when he went and became a member of the Obama administration cabinet, uh, which unfortunately, he did a great job in that role and, and was one of the more, you know, had great relationships on both sides of the aisle in that capacity. So I would just say that, just give him some credit. He's, there has been some work in this space. Let's look at what's worked in the past and where we've gotten away from it. The perpetual, you know, Tuesday, Thursday club in Congress now, at least on the House side, has really uh, made members now spend more time in their districts than in Washington. Well, that's not what you elect them for. I mean, you want them to do stuff in D.C. and legislatively. So we should look at some of the yeah. historical things. I know they are, and I, I'm encouraged by that. scheduling changes so he's worked more intensively yeah. for 10 days, and then they go home and get some more done. But Scott, Frank, I'll just, jump in. Yeah, I'll just touch, I'll touch the, on the uh, spontaneity piece. I, I, think we, uh, I think we're already seeing a spontaneous you know, revolution of sorts already unfolding <coughs> both on, on the national level. Obviously, you're seeing it on a, on a global level. Uh, but on, st on a state level, you're seeing it around the whole issue of teacher pay. You saw it here in West Virginia uh, f over two years, uh, leading you know, big efforts in Charleston that, uh, that, that made some progress. And we saw the same thing happening in teacher movements in about nine or 10 other states. Those things happen spontaneously. Uh, I, I know in many cases they didn't necessarily happen because it was being led at the top by AFT or NEA. It was happening because rank and file teachers in the states really kind of took the bull by the horn and, and ran with it. parents too, frankly. Parents, huh? par parents too. And parents too. So I think you're gonna see more of that. And I, that, that, that's actually a, one of the good things that's going on in the world. So there are good things. You know, you know why we have a 21, this is a subject near to, and dear to every college campus, you know why we have a 21-year-old drinking age in this country? Where did that come from? Mothers against drunk driving. Okay? And, the, and they work the governors like crazy. I heard, and I heard from several governors, you know what it's like to have several mothers who've lost children in your office? So the, the, the you know, it's very easy and normal, I think, to get very disillusioned about our system and how it works. But there's still a remarkable amount of accountability in this system. You still do have access, especially at a local and state level. And we have a ridiculous obsession with the federal government. Yes. Like yeah. we talk about education all the time. The federal government has a fraction of the budget of, of how education is run. Eight percent. Tiny, single digits. Yeah. Okay, now it has a bigger percentage of responsibility, for example, on the EPA and climate change and setting regulations there. So it varies. but. I, I think that the, the, the experiment, the American experiment, and it's still an experiment, which is why we got a little suspense in this play going on right now, right? We don't know how this is going to turn out. It, 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 it is and it should be a grassroots a democracy, a bottom-up, and it's those students and those mothers and voters. So Iowa tonight, okay, could there be a surprise there? We're all going to be voting. I, I think we're all going to be voting in, in November. Is that going to be a, some kind of expression one way or the other? Um, so I, I, am, I am not a Pollyanna on this. I mean, I, we have very serious problems. We are divided. We, we have chased out the compromise. There is, there, is, there is serious cause for concern. But I like to refer to myself as a glass half empty optimist. So <laughs> I'll just leave it with you there. So let me, let, me, let me push that a little again. And we had a little conversation just in the hallway before we came in. You know, George W. Bush said, I'm a uniter, not a divider. And uh, having gotten to know the Bush family a bit in, in these intervening years and being close with his campaign manager, I believe he was genuine. 
And I he went to a mosque after 9-11 and said this is not going to be yes. a religious war. And he, he, I think it was exemplary in that behavior. And Barack Obama said we're not a blue nation, we're not a red nation, we're, we're a purple nation. We need to appreciate all the different sides. So you've already said he's got to come ground, you know, from the ground floor up. It's got to be a revolution. But we've talked about, you know, what did Gandhi do? What did Mandela do? In some ways, what did Martin Luther King do to try to push for justice in a way that was not, if you will, it was adversarial in the sense of opposing people, but with a, a loving side. Is there a role? Could there be new leadership that takes us out of this a bit and helps hasten our recovery yes. from this situation? Yes. Yeah. No, yeah I think it's so. A whole I, new genera- I mean, I, I, one of the, I, I tell my friends who do campaign work, I said, are you paying attention to the party registration numbers in your state? Because I know in my state of Pennsylvania, where I live currently, it's uh, independents have now passed yeah. both other parties. Uh, that tells me a lot. People are being turned off by the rhetoric and actions and behaviors of politicians in both parties, and I think that it's never been more ripe for something to emerge, whether within a party or outside or some other way. Think there could be a third party? Um, not right now, but I think it's ripe for a dramatic change. And whether it's with both parties or a third party, I think we're on the cusp of something. You think one or both of these parties could actually self-destruct? Yes, I do. I, really well, I think do. yeah, I agree. I agree. I think we're on the verge of it, and it'll be inter- interesting to see what happens tonight in Iowa. But I'm willing to predict if Bernie wins Iowa by five, six points, you're going to see the official Democratic Party and the DNC. They're going to go crazy, and they're going to try to take the system, take over the the race the way they did four years ago, and uh, it's going to turn off a lot of people. Other thoughts about the transcendent leadership that might be able to solve the problems? So, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, again, I think we're, we, we are on the cusp of a generation, generational change. I find it remarkable that Joe Biden, 77, Trump, Biden, Warren, all, all these folks are in their 70s. Bloomberg. Bloomberg. We're, yo- we're young. I know. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Uh, no, but I mean, it's, it's like, huh? And so Buttigieg comes along, and he's really young, and he's got, you know, not very many votes in his life, and he hasn't run very much, but look at the traction that he's getting. Right. And if you look at the, at the, at the Democrats over time who have won, and they're, they're young, JFK and Obama and some of these others. Well, Clinton was young when he was Clinton. Yeah. Yeah. Now, not that that was all, you know. Nine, right. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, but. You know, and, and, and here's the other thing, and, you know, I see the president here. That this, today's students have grown up in a different world. They have different expectations, different definitions of what it means to be alive and to be engaged with one another. They have a different sense of what diversity means and what, what society is going to reflect. There was a recent poll from the Panetta Institute, and they, they, they um, surveyed the college students, Democrats and Republicans, And the Republican college students were close to 60% who believe not only climate change is happening, but the government should be aggressive in addressing it. So there's a big disconnect generationally. This generational shift, this digital generational shift, is going to be very significant. And that's where this leadership is going to come from. And I don't know if we know who it's going to be yet. All right. Somebody may rise up, either party. So this actually is a good segue. Uh, We got a couple of questions from... Uh, the audience, and let's see if we can um, put this one out and see how you react to it. Uh, apropos, Frank, to what you just said, here's a question that set reads, are we struggling with an informational gap, or is it a generational gap? It's, could it be an informational generational gap? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah um, my kids, who are millennials, now complain that they can't keep up with the, with the technology that's going on around. And I said, well, how do you think I feel? You know, I mean, I'm just trying to book a ticket on United Airlines. Give me a break. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so their way of engaging with one another, engaging with commerce, engaging with the world is completely different. The, every study you look at about millennials and what they're demanding in the workplace and what they're demanding in terms of corporate social responsibility and all the rest is a completely different thing. It's transformational. I, I remember talking to a president of a utility recently, and he was talking about how when they have their new clients coming in, the big ones like the, the, the Targets and the Facebooks, you know, the server farms and all the rest, they are demanding renewable power. Why are they demanding renewable power?
are because the millennials who are working for them and the companies that are being run by others are demanding a different. So the, the, there's a lot of change afoot, and that is going to drive a, a, a different generation. But it's a generation that's defined by the information environment they live in. Anybody else want to add? No, I, I, just very quickly, I, 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 I think it's more than just generational, but I think that's a big part of it. I mean, if you look at the, the major shifts, I mean, we had a major shift when the boomers came of age uh, back in the late 60s. It was quite a tumultuous time as well, enormous cultural change that we brought now that we're whining about because the younger group that's now a larger demographic than we were uh, and now has more financial power than we do now uh, has stepped up. So I think this is not uncommon. I would just encourage you all, one of my favorite demographers, I did some graduate work in demography at Georgetown about four dozen years ago, but one demographer, Ken Dykewald, has written some and done some work on what's called the age wave, done some really remarkable work about generation, how each generation patterns and cycles, and it's really worth looking at that that helps us all understand how these generational changes impact our society. That's very helpful. Let me pose a question then to you that's a little out of bounds of what we've been talking about which is this, um, we've been exclusively focused on the United States tonight, yet many would argue that Western democracies are in crisis around the world. Do you have observations about how we relate to the rest of the world and what are the larger patterns that affect not only us but other countries? And I, I just have a personal story on this um, from my experience uh, when I worked in the Senate. As Secretary of the Senate, I was responsible for uh, an office called International Affairs. And basically it was a small little shop that coordinated all the international travel, CODELs and whatnot, leadership CODELs, uh, congressional delegation trips for senators. And I was struck that back in the Cold War days, we had very intensive, very aggressive congressional Democrat and Republican engagement in international organizations. As soon as that Berlin Wall fell in the late 1980s, all of a sudden it stopped along with this wave of commercials attacking congressmen and senators for their international travel. So we now have our elected officials giving up on opportunities to engage their counterparts around the world, and they want us at the table. Uh, I was the U.S. representative alone as a, just a senior staff person, representative to an international parliamentary union trip in Turkey during my time, and trying to negotiate the schedule change so some senators would go. And I remember them saying, I'm not going to go to some confab with, you know, uh, at, at taxpayer expense. I'll get clobbered in my district before my reelection campaign. So we've been actually incentivizing, incentivizing our elected officials not to have more engagement with people from other parts of the world. I think that would really help. They shouldn't just hear from the executive branch, in my opinion. And I would just mention, uh, it, it'll be interesting to watch, uh, keep an eye on Britain, uh, they, they've kind of been a year ahead of us. Uh, you know, they were a year ahead of us with, with Brexit the first time, and then we elected Trump, and then now they've, Brexit has finally happened. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how the political structures unfold in Britain over the next six to 12 months, uh, and how the, how the parties do there. They're dealing with some of the same issues that we're dealing, Frank touched on, age issues, elitism, uh, corporatization, all of that stuff is hitting Britain. So it'd be interesting to watch them. They're kind of like a, a laboratory case for us to watch and see how maybe we play out things differently in this country. Maybe we can learn from, see, I have the from solution. some of their I mistakes. I think that when, 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 when the House of Windsor collapses, we could have a queen and a king here and, and everything will be fine. Uh, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to see sort of how history unfolds and, and we're a very ahistorical country. Yeah. We, we really, we don't have a good appreciation for what we've, what we've experienced and how, how the, the cycles go. You know, we've had terribly tumultuous, divisive times. I remember working, you know, I had students in my class in tears after Trump was elected, and I, we, you know, I said, okay, please express yourself, and we talked. And I said to them at some point, I said, you know, let, let me talk to you about a year that, that we experienced called 1968, mm -hmm. where... Um, a presidential candidate was, was shot and killed, where Martin Luther King was shot and killed, where our cities were burning and we had tanks in the streets and troops would come home from Vietnam and get spit on or they would die in Vietnam in, 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 in nameless places for no good reason. Um, McCarthyism, you know, we, we 
destroyed people. My great aunt had her passport taken away. Because she was an artist and hung out with a bunch of artsy lefties in New York. And someday, the, one day, the FBI showed up on her door and took her passport away. What's, what was that all about? Um, we've been through a lot. That is part of our experience. And I think part of what we miss now is these, these sweeps. We're, this is a time of testing. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have read John Meacham's book, The Soul of America, but I really recommend it because it, he walks us through these, these crises that we've gone through in our history. And we don't get right out of them, and it's not neat and tidy, but you know that's, that's part of the journey. So the world, the world is seeing this. It's not just the UK, it's Poland, it's Hungary, it's Brazil. It's, you know, it's these same tectonic plates, I think, that I talked about earlier that are afflicting a lot of these societies now. Okay. Mrs. Lincoln, please enjoy the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I get one more question from the audience that I'll conclude with in a moment and then ask you guys think about what you want to say, take a deep breath, and kind of think about the, the course of this evening and what, what hasn't been said you really want to say. But I'm going to take a little personal privilege here um, and ask a question that I hope will be fair-minded. Um, I have to say, I was raised with a sense of the importance of integrity, honesty, and of course reinforced by, you know, I shall never tell a lie, George Washington, or honest Abe. <coughs> and I think, I don't want to make this question only about the president, um, but I, I, I have a concern about whether there's some larger movement that's going away from people actually honoring truthfulness, even though we never get it exactly right, integrity, that the North Star is to tell the truth whenever possible. And I have friends and colleagues, and I'm in a lot of discussions of the future of our democracy now, who point to the fact that every time there's a new low, that becomes the new norm. And that's, that could be a problem. And some of the new norms we have maybe open up our society in ways that we're not as prudish in some ways, we're more accepting. We've had, you know, acceptance of gay marriage and other civil rights movements and so on that never would have happened before. But is there something different about what's going on now about fake news and about truthfulness that we should be commenting upon? And is there some chance that this is going to take hold, or is this going to be swept away when when there's a change in administrations? I I, I don't think we know. Is is the answer? I mean, I think the big question about this moment in time, and it's not just about Trump the president, but it's Trump the era, right. the anger and right. the disaffection and all of these things, is, is this a moment in time? Is this sort of an aberration? Is this a letting off of steam or something? Or is this a fundamental shift? And, and, and I don't, I, we really don't know. Um, there, what I can't, you know, what we know is there are millions of people who are engaged as they've not been before. There are a lot of organizations like yours um, and others that are spending massive amounts of time and money to try to keep us um, headed toward the truth and integrity. But there's no preordained answer here. That's why people need to be engaged and pay attention. So I, I think that the, the, the Again, if, I, if I'm reporting this story, which, which, I like, which I like to think I do sometimes, is that is it, it, it depends. Can I push? I want to push. Scott, you have something to say. I want to push you a little harder on this one. To me, it's one thing to have the political fortunes go left or right, conservative to liberal and so on. Um, and, you know, I find that totally normal and acceptable and probably healthy. But when it comes to telling the truth, which every major religion of any type, teaches us perhaps one of the most fundamental values we have. Have we gone over some line un unlike anything in history? Uh, and is there some other answer um, than, than you know, you know a swinging back and forth? Is there something different about the line we've crossed here? Where if you don't, if, you, if your word's not your bond and you can't rely on what people say, then the, the whole society feels like a house of cards to me. So. I'm a moderator. I'm just talking from a human point of view. I know that our processes don't work. Mm -hmm. And Kelly's been in the middle of them. Less people have integrity about what they say. They can offer their opinions. They can defend their own institutions. But at some point, they'll look at the facts and the evidence, and they will change their minds based upon what they hear. I, so think, if Scott, you, I think if you talk to the typical American today, they would probably say, yes, we have definitely crossed the line, and we need to, we need to restore our 
values. We need to restore integrity. Um, but th I think deep, deep inside, the, the American public, they, they, they're still so tied to integrity. They're still tied to values and responsibility. Uh, it's, it's, part of the, it's, it's part of the American experience. So I'm not really worried about no, that. I think we've, crossed the, we've definitely crossed the line. And, and yes, the, the man at 1600 is a bad guy, but there's plenty of other. He's not the only one. And there's plenty of other. We've lived through cycles where there's been so much corruption in politics and governors who've gone to jail. Uh, so it's in it, senators and, and, and members of Congress. So it, it's not any, I don't think it's probably any worse today than it was 25 years ago in terms of that. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think Robbie hit on something that's really important is that we need to really, uh, I think part of being humble, getting back to what I mentioned earlier, is the fact that having a, a <coughs> fact-based reality. Um, I'm reminded of a, a famous quote, in fact, it's on my pinned profile, pinned tweet on my profile where I, I quote John Adams from 1770. Many people don't realize that John Adams defended the British soldiers involved in the, British, in the, in the Boston Massacre back in 1770. And during the course of his uh, statements, closing statement during the trial, he won, by the way, the, the quote, facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclination, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. How applicable is that today compared to what it was in 1770? We are very much at that point. So uh, part of our, all of our challenge should be to get to a, as much, you know, you need to have, as people of faith, there are certain things you have to have faith in. And that does not mean you have, can ignore facts or choose which facts you want. Uh, Senator Moynihan had a famous quote about, you know, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Right. So I think returning to the, a, a return to a fact-based uh, reality and making that one of our missions as individuals will help us get to where we need to go. We're going to conclude with two quick rounds. I want to read one other question that came from the audience, and then we'll do, ask you to do uh, any final statements of wisdom to contradict what you've already said. Uh, so here's a good question, which is, what solution do you suggest for a quote? Me, now you're all media experts in, in many ways. What solution do you suggest for a quote media, since newspapers are rarely read and social media is less structured? So any last thoughts about? media in regard to this question from the audience? Well, the, 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 media, the media is a different experience now, all right? So as, as you pointed out, you know, the days of Walter Cronkite are long gone. Uh, I, I ask my students how many here um, have read, uh, have watched an evening newscast, and, they, and I'm not sure they even know what an evening newscast is. <laughs> uh, I have literally asked my journalism students how many here have bought a hard copy newspaper, you know, that thing made out of paper that comes to your door. And most of my journalism students have not bought a newspaper. Right? They read online. They consume a ton of information from all over the world. So the, the, the media future is, a, is, is a, a hybridized future where you've got multimedia. CNN has broken records with viewership, not on television but online. The New York Times is doing documentaries and podcasts in a, in a remarkable way. So. We're, and, and whether it's now this, now this news, which is, I bet students here certainly know and probably um, others in the audience do not, has spawned all kinds of new expressions. Um, and so the, the, the new media landscape, the emerging media landscape, much more diverse, much more creative, um, shorter, because most people are reading on these things. So how long are you standing in line for your latte? That's how long you read your article. Uh, uh, Axios has a, their, their, their watchword, their motto is smart brevity, which is really good if you want to get something that's brief, but if something is big and long and complex, well, but there are, you know, we watch The Crown year after year and we have these big long series, so we act, you know, Ronan Farrow does pretty well with his big long takes, so we, we have an attention span too. So I think there will not be a single media response. Those days are long gone, and so what, what, I, but what I would like to see and I will, I will shout out NPR and public broadcasting because I think public broadcasting does an exceptional job. Not perfect, but an exceptional job. You can applaud. <laughs> and they do that because why? Because they have stations and members here and in Idaho and in Miami and all over the country, and they can draw on that. 
whereas CNN does not have a bureau in West Virginia or in Ohio or in Idaho. And so, um, you know, seeing some more public media, um, local media is increasingly talking about community support and almost the member model. Paul Huntsman, who bought the Salt Lake Trib not too long ago, turned it into a nonprofit, is building a, uh, um, an endowment for it, and will have members not unlike you, or, or just trying to do that, not unlike you would have for public radio. So people are now invested in it. So investing people in their media, I think, is, is, is going to be helpful. But it, it ain't going to be a simple, you know, roadmap. I, I remember I had a, you all know who Bill Moyers is? Okay, so Bill Moyers is one of my heroes. He's amazing. And I remember having a conversation with him a few years ago, and he did an unbelievable series in the 1980s on the crisis in the black family. I don't know if you remember that. And it prompted congressional hearings that had that effect. And he said to me, Frank, I don't have that. Nobody has that Im impact anymore, where you're that one big shining light. You know, you can spur things, but there's just a lot of noise out there. So the, the media environment will be a changing media environment, but, but powerful, but dispersed, and diverse. Well, and, and I want to touch on a media project that Frank and I have actually been working on together for the past two years. Uh, my family, we have funded a program at at, with the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW and at WVU at the College of Media to, uh, to bring, and this started after the 2016 election because we wanted to make sure that the kids that are going to school in an urban area or a blue state know how, the how their peers are learning in a red state. West Virginia is a red state, so we, we united GW and WVU together, and we've been doing this now. We're, we're getting ready to go into our third year where, where we've brought students from Morgantown, linked them up with students from Frank's program at GW, and also brought the kids from GW to Morgantown and throughout West Virginia. The first year they looked at the natural gas pipelines that are going from, from Pennsylvania down through North Carolina, through West Virginia, and the impact that has on the economy, on, on business, on health, all of those issues covering that. They did a great job. This past year they just finished a, a, a series looking at the opioid crisis in West Virginia and looking at the number of kids who are parentless because their parents are addicted to opioids or they're dead. And the, and the, and the crisis that's been created because these kids have no parents and the need for more foster children. NBC just followed up on that series last week and now the state legislature in West Virginia are, is starting to take a look at how to come up with better programs for foster kids in West Virginia. So that's what journalism is all about. That's kind of the new way of journalism. That's great, that's great. Listen, thank you. Um, I just want to say what an honor it's been to be part of this distinguished panel and learn so much from all of you. I'm going to ask you each, because we're a little past time, collect your thoughts for a second here and up to one minute each before I turn it over to David. David, would that be all right? One last round. So. Let, let me just, I'm going to interject. Sir, sir I think uh, I want to just honor what you said. What Scott said was his own opinion. It's not necessarily shared by other members of the panel here. There's no one, no one here taking, no one here officially taking positions about, you know, what, uh, in terms of as a group or as an institution or that uh, on whether the president's a good guy or a bad guy. That was one person's opinion. I want to clarify that. That's Scott was not talking on behalf of the group and does not necessarily represent the views of anyone but himself on that. So I'm uh, sorry for and that. I don't think I said he was a bad guy anyway, but. Yeah. Oh, maybe I did. Okay. All right. Okay. He's not a good guy, that's for sure. Well, that's, that's one man's opinion. And, yeah. So 
with that, sorry about that. Let me see if we can get, uh, I just, I'll say my last words to thank all of you for being such a attentive audience, much appreciated. And just, uh, again, what an honor to be part of this group in no particular order. Kelly, you want to lead us off? Let's just get some final comments before we turn it back to Dave. Yeah, I just, I just want, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, my friend David Welch, who I've known for a long time. I want to thank Bonnie and Bill Sibblefield for their investment and time and effort to build this. There is a real critical need to really uh, to improve civil communication in our country. And I think we can do it in a way that does not require us to give up our principles or even our, our beliefs. Uh, it's just a manner of, of communicating to each other, showing respect, <laughs> as I mentioned before, uh, humility. So I just think that is, I'd leave that as a challenge. One thing I, I also want to, um, and I, I got into a Facebook spat this week with someone who was saying, we shouldn't have any, we just don't do politics at the dinner table if we have people of multiple parties. And I said, wrong, wrong. Yeah. wrong. I said, of course you do politics. There's a right way and a wrong way. So I do want to encourage you to please don't make that decision not to engage because, right. well, you, like my wife has a sign she loves to put up, which I've now I've hidden from her. It's a politics-free zone. No. We can have political discussions like that. We just have to know how to do it more effectively. So with that, I'll, just, I'll yield the floor, as they say in the Senate. I'm not mediating between you and your wife. Let's move on. <laughs> Well, I, 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 too, want to thank Bill and Bonnie Stubblefield. We would not be here tonight without them, uh, their support for this institute. It's one of the few programs like this in the country. Uh, Shepard is on the verge of just doing unbelievable things with this program. Big thanks to Mary Hendricks, our president of Shepard University, for her leadership and helping pull this together. Uh, when I wake up every day, I just thank myself that I'm part of this. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I'm going to leave, I don't need a minute, I'm going to leave you with one quote uh, that I've lived by for 40, more than 40 years when I was editor of the Daily Athenaeum at West Virginia University, and I came across this motto that the Hotting Carter family, who published newspapers in Mississippi during the Civil Rights era, and their motto, which we adopted at the Daily Athenaeum, was, little good is accomplished without controversy, and no civic e evil is overcome without publicity. That says it all right there, and that's what we're about. Amen. Right. So my closing comment would be, don't lose hope. <laughs> you know, it's, um, the, nobody ever said it would be easy. And I said to, to my students, I said, well, maybe we didn't serve you so well as your parents, because we put helmets on your heads and pads on your knees and your elbows, and we give you a trophy after every game, and we said it would be easy. <laughs> and it's not. Okay, you got to take a stand. You got to stand for something. Sometimes you lose. Sometimes it sucks. Do what you need to do, and that's what people are being called on now. It's you know a little scary out there, but I'll leave you with this: How many how many grandmas are there in the room? Any grandmas? Yeah, no. a few. Okay, okay, grandmas. You got a lot. I play the grandma game with my students. So here's the grandma game. I'll say, How many of you have a grandma? And oops, and hands go up. I said, That's awesome. Who's got the oldest grandma in the room? And we'll go 78, 88, 98, 98. That's amazing. You got great genes. If you live to your grandma's age, what year is that? And this is when I know there are no math majors in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it is a real problem. <laughs> it's getting easier because the freshmen were born in 2000. Scary. <laughs> okay, they go, oh my god, 2098. I said, you, if, you, if you live to your grandma's age, that's 2098. In 2050, halfway there, there are 10 billion people on this planet. You are going to see so much change. You are going to be challenged in so many ways. You are going to have so many things that you're up against. So dig in, get ready, and go for it. And that's what they're doing. They really are. And it won't be easy, and it will be noisy, and there's going to be lots of setback. But my glass is half empty. I'm still an optimist. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it was great. Thank you, uh, each and every one of you, for your time tonight. It was a great American conversation, and uh, I'm proud of all of you. I just want to mention, too, that Scott and Kelly are both on our board of advisors, so that's the kind of diversity that we have. And I wanted to tell just one story, if I may, about the Stubblefields. Uh, Debbie and I were over at their house for dinner about two Saturdays ago. Daryl Scholl was there as well. He's in the audience. Bill and Bonnie are the only couple I know that have an ate some for dinner around the dining room table, and they purposefully invite six other people that they disagree with. 
to talk politics at the dinner table. That is an example of where we need to go, folks. Invite people who disagree with you over to your house for dinner and have a dinner conversation with them. I hope you'll all stay for our reception. We have refreshments in the back of the room. Uh, they were, um, if there's any left, I think there are some. Uh, I think there's wine and, and the other things as well. I also want to announce our March 12th conversation series forum uh, tonight. I don't think it's gotten out yet, but it's going to be called uh, Healthcare, the Issue of Our Time. It will feature two nationally prominent presenters, one advocating market-driven solutions uh, to, uh, to health care and the other a co-architect of ACA in the Obama administration. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Susan Denzer, who is a former health care correspondent for the NewsHour on PBS. So that's March 12th. It will be over in the Frank Center. Uh, I would advise you to get your tickets for that early because I do think it's going to be a pretty um, full house. With that, thank you guys. Uh, we'll probably put some females on the panel next time. I'm just letting you know. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Well done, sir. Good job.